seen one, two, six. We up? There we go. I say, I hear sound. All right. Let's go ahead and stand as we open up in prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for tonight. And Lord, many things are going on. It's easy to lose track. It's uh, busy, and a lot of people are in need of prayer, and we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. I thank you, Father, that we can come to you each and every single day and just trust you and know that you're doing the right thing for us. And Lord, regardless of the circumstances around, I pray in Jesus' name that we would keep our eyes focused on you. Help us, Father God, to be in tune with your word and just to love you more and more each day, to be bold in our witness, to stand up for the things that are true. And Lord, help us every time we run into someone, we need to talk to them. I pray, Lord, that you would be with those who need a physical healing, Father. There are many who are in the hospital. I ask, Lord, that you'd watch over them and be with them. Lord, as we go through your word tonight, we thank you, Father, the the detail, the straightforwardness of it, and we thank you that it's alive and well and sharp. Lord, let every word that is spoken be your words, and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, go ahead and take a seat. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, we're going to chapter 33. Chapter 33 goes into a discussion about Jerusalem. We know that previous uh, chapters have spoken about Sennacherib coming in from Assyria, the situations that he brought in surrounding the city of Jerusalem. The northern kingdom was taken and Jerusalem was in distress. Isaiah was trying to get them to put their trust in the Lord and not to put their trust in man. They ended up going to Egypt, trying to get Egypt to help them. Egypt got wiped out. And when Egypt was wiped out, they realized that this is not going to be good. And when the Assyrians came in, it was a a pretty strong uh, situation where the people of the city were afraid. And yet Isaiah kept saying, trust in the Lord. Don't worry about it. He is going to carry you through. And so this is a continuation of that story. So as we look at chapter 33, it says, Woe to you who plunder, though you have not been plundered, and you who deal treacherously, though they have not dealt treacherously with you. When you cease plundering, you will be plundered. When you make an end of dealing treacherously, then, or excuse me, they will deal treacherously with you. And so now we're looking at this treacherous nation of Syria coming into the city of Jerusalem, surrounding it. The people are getting up. They're sending letters to the king, mocking Israel, mocking the God of Israel, putting them down, telling the people, do not worry and listen to your king, Hezekiah. We want you to listen to us. We're the ones who you need to fear. We've beaten all the other nations and all the other cities and their gods couldn't take care of you. At what point do you think your God is going to take care of you? And there are many things going on. And so those who plunder who have not been plundered because Assyria was very strong. No one came in and took Assyria. No one uh, dealt more treacherously than Syria when it came to the enemy. And Syria was a very evil and a very inhumane group of people who tormented and tortured the people that they took. They plundered everything. They got very wealthy doing it. And at the end of this verse, it says, when you make an end of dealing treacherously, they will deal treacherously with you. And we know for certain, as we look at 2 Kings chapter 18, and this is that whole battle, when you see the nation surrounding it and you understand how the Lord says that he will discomfit the enemy and the enemy will come upon itself. And we know that at the end of chapter 18, where... Uh, the word of the Lord concerning Sennacherib, that's actually chapter 19 in uh, chapter 2 Kings, chapter 19, verse 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, because you have not prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. And this is a word of the Lord, this is a word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. And he goes into the prophecy of the fall of Israel. But we also see as 2 Kings continues on how this war was taken and how Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, did lose his position, lost his power because 185,000 men of his army were wiped out at 
the city walls of Jerusalem. And when they got up in the morning, they saw all the corpses. The rest of the army took off and fled. Uh, we mentioned last week that Sennacherib had an army of about a million or so men, a very large, large army. And when 185,000 are discomfited and the angel of the Lord wipes them out, it puts fear. And so they ran. And so the king himself ended up getting assassinated by his two sons and not a good ending for them. He goes on in verse two and he says, O Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their arm every morning, our salvation also in time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people shall flee. Then, or when will you lift up yourself, yourself up? The nations shall be scattered and your plunder shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar as a running to the to and fro of the locusts. He shall run upon them. And so the Assyrians are coming down, and he says, you know, it's just going to be, the Lord's going to be gracious. We want you to be gracious. We want you to, you know, take care of us. Isn't that what we pray? Lord, help us take care of our enemies. Um, but who is your enemy? You really have to stop and think about it. Who is your enemy? We have a lot of enemy, and, and we pluralize it. We say enemies. We put an S at the end of it. But in reality, as a believer, we have one enemy, and that's Satan himself. We don't have to look at the whole world and say, well, I've got an enemy of, you know, multiplicity. It's just Satan coming against the believers. And so our prayer should be, Lord, come quickly, bind up Satan, cast him into the pit of hell, let it all be over. That should be the end of it. And yet the heart of man, the created heart of man is fickle, is uncertain, is doubtful. It changes, it wavers, it falters, it changes almost daily. You know, I love you. I hate you. I, I am a winner. I'm a loser. I agree. I disagree. And we need to be steadfast in our strength for the Lord and in our words for the Lord. He goes on in verse five. He says, the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He has lift or he has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. It's interesting, wisdom and knowledge. There's a verse over in Hosea, and I got to find it now. It just came to mind. I was reminded of it over in chapter four, and it says this, I believe it's in verse six. Let me make sure. Yeah, uh, Hosea chapter four, verse six. Hosea was prophesying to the nation of Israel, and this was a charge against Israel. He says this in verse 6 of Hosea chapter 4. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. And it's interesting. Your people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And you take a look back in Isaiah and you see these words. The Lord is exalted. He dwells on high. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your time. Why is it that we take knowledge and we throw it away? We take wisdom, we throw it away. We take common sense and we throw it away. Instead of being students and instead of taking the time to understand the things of the Lord and study it, you know, bit by bit, you know, expositional, precept upon precept, line upon line, instead of doing that, we find ourselves just arbitrarily listening to things and, ad and identifying with things and adopting things that may not be godly knowledge. It may not be godly wisdom. It may sound good. It may sound right. It may have the twist that is absolutely seeming in the right direction. But if you truly stop and you think about it, and you take 10 minutes of logic and just sit down and say, okay, Lord, what is it that you're saying? I'm, I'm seeing one thing and I'm hearing one thing. And yet if I balance it according to your word because that's how we as Christians do it. We take the word of God and we balance what's said. If it's in the word, it's okay. If it's not in the word, then we cannot use it as doctrine. And yet, if you use knowledge today, it's almost like you're a fool. Oh, you can't do that. You have to listen to what we say. We know this in our education system. The education system does not teach people how to think anymore. We'll teach you what to think, not how to think. You better do what we say. You better think how we think. You better accept what we teach, because if you don't, we'll flunk you. We'll fail you. 
It's interesting going through college and you listen to the titles of the courses and you find out that every course has to do with some kind of ethics or some kind of whatever it may be. And if you, Lord forbid, you go against that, then you find yourself coming out with a bad grade. When in reality, the Bible encourages us, use the knowledge that he's given us, be knowledgeable in, accept the fact that God gave you a brain and that you can use it and don't perish because of lack of knowledge. Get knowledge and be biblical in it because wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. <laughs> I think we've seen wisdom and knowledge and the lack thereof causing instability beyond recognition in today's culture. He goes on in verse 7, Surely their valiant ones shall cry outside. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. The highways lie waste. The, traveler and the traveling man ceases. He has broken the covenant. He has despised the cities. He regards no man. The earth mourns and languishes. Lebanon is shamed and, shrivel, and shriveled. Sharon is like a wilderness, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. He's just talking about the, the, the decimation of everything that the Assyrians had done. They come in, they wipe it out. Everything is broken, and everything is laid waste and vacant. There's no one on the streets. There's no one moving around. It's just a terrible time to be. Now, I will arise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. You shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. In other words, your own words will judge you. You know, the... Uh, the generation is at a low point. Israel, Jerusalem is at a low point. Uh, Syria is being lifted up and God's using an ungodly nation to judge what was God's chosen people. Shouldn't use that as past tense. What, who is God's chosen people? You know, and be careful what you say because when he's, he speaks about it, you shall conceive chaff and you're bring, your, bring forth your own stubble. Your breath as a fire shall devour you. you know, be careful what you say. He says, and the people shall be like the burnings of lime, like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. And, and the way they make lime, and most people know this, they get the material and they actually heat it up to an intense heat and it turns into a powder. You know, and that lime is really something that can be held. But if you ever, if you ever stuck your hand in a bag of lime, it's an interesting feeling. You, you can feel it. But when you grab it, it just kind of vanishes in your hand. It's one of those things, it's a substance, but it can disappear. It's used, you know, you, you mix it with other material, you can make a good concrete or whatever it may be. But if you have just straight up lime and you try to grab it, if you grab it quickly, it literally just disappears in your hand. It's an interesting thing. And, you know, the burnings of lime, like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. Because what good are thorns except for fire? Hear you who are afar off what I have done. And you who are near, acknowledge my might. You know, hear, listen, obey, heed. It's another word for it. The Shema, you know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one, hear. You know, we read the word of God, but do we heed the word of God? We listen to the word of God, but do we heed the word of God? Is it something that you hear or is it something that you ramble on and then you realize you really haven't heard? You know, someone's speaking, you're listening, but you're not hearing what they're saying. And children do that all the time when they're in trouble. They hear what you're saying, but they don't listen to what you're saying. You know, do you understand? And all they go is, yeah, yeah. You know, because they just don't quite grasp it. They're still learning on that learning curve. And it's important in the biblical Christian context to make sure that you hear and you listen and you obey the word of God and know that he is mighty. And then he calls a spade a spade in verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. The sinners in Zion. It's interesting. Those are God's chosen people. You know, the, the, the people of Israel. The sinners, they're, they're sinners. And, you know, is every human being on the planet a sinner? Yeah, and they are. And yet there are some people who run around and say, well, as a Christian, we're not sinners. How can that be? That's not a true statement. That's not a biblical statement. I think the proper statement is, okay, I am a sinner saved by grace. Thus the Lord no longer views me as a sinner. He sees me as his child. He sees me as a son, as his daughter. He sees me as a, as a saved individual, not as the title sinner, even though the sin within me is still there. 
And hopefully the power of God and the love of Christ overshadows that and overpowers that. And I don't fall into temptation. And he's looking at his people and saying, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearlessness or fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. <laughs> and it is true, isn't it? Hypocrisy is something that will always cause fear. And here's the reason why. You're not standing on a decision. You don't make a decision for right or wrong. Hypocrisy is, I agree with you over there, and I agree with you over here. Because in scriptures, we see that the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that because you are lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. What does lukewarmness mean? Does lukewarmness mean that the individual who is lukewarm is not saved? Or does lukewarmness mean the individual who's a carnal Christian? Is a lukewarmness someone who's riding the fence and can go either way uh, into heaven when they die or into hell? And I think we have to understand that he says, I'd rather have you hot or I'd rather have you cold. Because if you're hot, you're on fire for me. You're living your life for me. You're doing what I have called you to do. If you're cold, you're a sinner anyway. You're going to sin without conscience until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you. And at least the cold person can be turned to a hot person. But a lukewarm person is one who has just been simmering in this delusion. All is okay. And when you take a look at Matthew chapter 7, and you see in verses 20 and 21 where the Lord's speaking to the people, and they say, but Lord, we did miracles. We cast out demons in your name, and we've, we've done these things in your name. And he looks at them and says, depart from me, for I never knew you. And again, the lukewarm person is one who's deceived into, I'm doing miracles, I'm casting out demons, you know, we're calling on your name and doing these, these things, and you can see that we're doing this, Lord, and we call you Lord, but he doesn't know them. That individual is lukewarm, and what does the word say? Take the lukewarm and cast them out. I do not know you. And it's a tough place to be. And when you take a look at this, the hypocrite is one who is in the middle. They're lukewarm. They're on this side over here because they can't make a decision. And you know the statement. One who never makes a decision has already decided, haven't they? Because when they come to you and they say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And if you say, yes, we're going to kill you. And if you say, no, we'll keep you. If you flounder, what decision do you make? You see, and it's a difficult thing. And he goes on and he says this, Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? Who or he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands but refu and refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eye off from seeing evil, he will dwell on high, his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him, and his water will be sure. When you take a look at how the fire of the Lord, we see this in Deuteronomy chapter 4. It says, The Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 9 also says this, Understanding therefore this day that the Lord thy God, he which goes over before you is a consuming fire. How does God deal with things in the future? How is God going to judge the world? We see this in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. We see the fire of the Lord. We see the burning sensation of God the Father. You know, so, you know, if, if you're going to dwell with everlasting burnings, you know, who are you? Who's going to do it? Walking righteously and speaking uprightly, despising the oppressions. Those are the ones who are going to live righteous. You do not take a bribe. You, you, he who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. You don't get involved with it. You don't drop to, you know, read the book of Proverbs. You know, Solomon really goes to town. Don't hang out with guys that corrupt you. Do not Go with the people who cause bloodshed. They come to you and say, we got a plan. We're going to go rob a bank. Come with us. We'll do it at night. No one will get caught. You'll get 10% of all the taking. You know, don't do it. Don't do it. But the fire of the Lord is a consuming fire. You see this over and over. When Jesus showed up in the vision in Revelation, 
What did John see? Eyes of flame of fire. Feet of burning bronze. Bronze representing judgment. And the burning of the bronze, the heating of the bronze means a fiery judgment, an intense judgment. You see all of that throughout the pictures in the scripture as the Bible shows the visions of Christ. He says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Your heart will, be, your heart will meditate on terror. And he says, where is the scribe? You know, this is past tense. Your heart will meditate on terror. No, it's, it's not. Past tense. You know, where is the scribe? Who's writing this down? Where is he who weighs or the one who has the scales of the balance, the one who judges? Where is he who counts the towers? He says, you will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception of a stammering tongue that you cannot understand. This is going to be something, the majestic king, the king of kings and lord of lords. And I think right now we're praying for the Lord to return. We're praying for the king to set up his kingdom. We're saying, Lord, come quickly. We're saying, Lord, let there be peace in Jerusalem. You know, and eventually there will be no stammering. There will be no stumbling. The king will speak clearly and people will understand without question. That doesn't mean they won't question because we do know that here on earth during the time of judgment, there will be a lot of questions. There are going to be people who get saved through the tribulation, and there are going to get people who continue to reject during the tribulation. We're going to see people after the millennium, after the millennial reign when Satan is released, we're going to see those people be deceived by Satan. They're going to choose to follow him, and they will be carried in the judgment. It's the, the heart of man, because we're a, made, we're a created being, we're a made being, we're created in the image of God, and yet with a fallen nature. And it's a hard balance because this nature desires for us to be in a position to where we want our own way. We want our own thoughts. We want our own abilities to shine through. And God says, no, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. He says, look upon Zion, the, whole, or the city of our appointed feasts. Your eye will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. Not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there the majestic Lord will be for us, a place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley with oars will sail. No warships will go, nor majesty, no majestic ships pass by. There's going to be peace in Jerusalem. It will be a beautiful time when it's there. And right now, it's not a quiet home. Israel has been at war since day one when they went back in May of 1948. There is no peace in Israel. I wish there was. It's a great place to be because, quite frankly, if you're going to die somewhere, that's probably the best place to die. Not that you're closer to God being in Jerusalem when you die, but you know, it'd be, if, it's just a very safe place. You know, If you're walking down the streets of Israel, you're safe as all can be because they're very alert to everything that goes on. There's a package there. They call in the package. They cordon the area off. They get the bomb squad out there. Make sure it doesn't blow up. Someone left their lunch. Huh. Bologna sandwich. There we go. You know, it's just the way it is. But right now, there's no peace. The pointed feasts, the tabernacle, and all these things. And yet Jerusalem is a city that has been the center of wars since the beginning. And the reason being is because Satan hates Israel. Why does Satan hate Israel? Because the Messiah came from Israel. Why does the Messiah come from Israel? Because that's what God chose. You know, what a time, the majestic Lord. He will be there. You know, Israel's going to win every battle. Even though they're outnumbered and outgunned, they always win. He goes on in verse 22, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Wouldn't that be great if we said that in our nation? Can you imagine somebody up in Washington standing up on television and saying, hey, I'm going to read this verse, verse 22, chapter 33 of the book of Isaiah. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. That would be great. But for some reason, I don't predict that happening. At least not yet. There may be some people who want to say it, but they don't have the gumption to actually get up there and say it. But the Lord is all of the, he's our judge, our lawgiver, our king. He's the one who saves us. And I praise God for that because we can put our rest and our hope and our trust in him and in him alone. 
Your tackle is loosed. They could not strengthen their mast. They could not spread the sail. Then the prey of great plunder is divided. The lame take the prey, and the inhabitant will not stay. I am sick. The people will dwell in it, and they will be forgiven their iniquities or their iniquity. You know, God is a God of forgiveness. People always say, well, the Old Testament, God's mean, he's judgmental, and he kills everyone. You know, and that's not the case. The Lord is a very gracious, loving, merciful God, both Old Testament and uh, New Testament. And that's just what the Lord is, because the Lord loves us to the point to where he does not want anyone to die. He does not want anyone to go into hell. Now... Chapter 34 is an interesting chapter because this is not a locality. This chapter is not based on a location. It's not talking about the nation of Israel. It's not talking about the nation of Beirut. It's not talking about Iran, Iraq. This is national. This is global. And it says, come near you nations and come to hear and heed you people. All the nations are called. You need to come. You need to heed. You need to listen to what's going on. I want all the nations to come. And he says, let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all things that come from it. Everything about the earth needs to listen, needs to pay attention. You know, in the book of Romans, we see this. Nature itself cries out. We see this, that nature was created. You know, Jesus, when he was writing in, he said, hey, tell you guys to stop saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. What was Jesus' response? Well, if I tell them to shut up, the stones are going to start screaming. They're going to start praising. The stones will do. Why? Because the earth longs for the coming. We know that nature is something that God created. And if man's not going to worship God, if he let it, then all of nature would. And yet nature proves who God is. You know, heed, listen, understand. He says, the indignation of the Lord is against all nations. The indignation, the wrath of God, the coming judgment, the book of Revelation, the tribulation period, the great tribulation period, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, everything that's going to go on when the Lord brings his indignation, the Jacob's trouble, the time of the end, God's wrath. What is the difference between God's wrath and and the persecution. You know, there is a huge difference. And some people try to justify certain prophecies based on the word persecution and based on the word wrath or based on tribulation, you know. And there's a huge difference. Persecution is strictly man upon man. Man persecutes man. It's not God's will for that to happen, but under God's authority and under the God's omniscience, he knows that man will attack man. He saw that in Cain and Abel. Is what was his warning to Cain? Cain, don't you know that if you do not repent of your sin, this thing will overtake you and bad things are going to happen and repent of your sin and move forward and do the right thing. And what does Cain do? He goes out and he kills his brother. That's persecution. I'm going to take my anger out on my brother and I'm going to kill my brother because his sacrifice was accepted and not mine. So that's persecution. The wrath is something that comes on unbelievers. Scripture after scripture after scripture. The wrath of God upon the unrighteous. The wrath of God upon the unbeliever. The wrath of God upon those who are unrighteous. And it happens quickly. When you take a look, well, matter of fact, really, really quick, look at uh, the book of Revelation. Just take a look at chapter 6. When you take a look at chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, the church age is ended, ended in chapter 2 and 3. Chapter 4 and 5, we see the heavenly visions. In chapter 6, we start to see the seals opened on the book where the lamb takes the book out of the angel's hand and it's got the scroll with the seven seals on it. The scroll is written on the inside and on the outside. The scroll by the majority of all scholars say that this is the title deed to the earth that is re or brought back into the hand of God. And when you take a look at chapter 6, we have the four horsemen. We're all familiar with these. You know, verse one, I saw the lamb open the first of its seals, one seal. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with the thunder, come and see and behold a white horse. So we see the white horse. Look at verse four, another horse, fiery red. Look at verse six, another voice, four living creatures saying a quart of wheat for a denarii and denarii for a barley or, you know, and, and the price of all that. Take it well, back up to verse five. When he opened up the third seal, he said, come and see and behold a black horse. And look at verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, 
I heard a voice of the four living creatures saying, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death and by the beast of the earth. And so now we're starting to see the judgment. And in the first four horsemen, 25% of the remaining population of the planet gets wiped out by this one horseman. It is led up. The Antichrist is the, the white horse showing up. The second horse that comes around, the fiery red horse is war. The black horse is famine. And the, third, and the fourth horse, the pale horse is death and all the other things. And if you notice, it was given them the power and 25% of the population was wiped out. What do we see in the churches? When you take a look and back up into, into uh, chapter three and you take a look at uh, the faithful church in verse seven, uh, this is the church of Philadelphia. He says, these, says uh, these things says he who is holy, who is true, who has a key of David. He opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. You have a little strength. You have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Back up into chapter 2, look at verse 8, to the angel of the church of Smyrna. These things says the first and the last, who was dead and who came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. The word Smyrna, Smyrna is actually to be myrrh, to get crushed, is to be um, crushed so that the scent of myrrh can come out. That's what the name Smyrna actually means. And when he says these things, I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty. This is a church going through tribulation. What church today out of the seven churches goes through tribulation, goes through persecution? Well, any church outside of America that's a Bible-believing church. There is not a nation anywhere on the planet today that will not persecute the church. They all want to get rid of Jesus Christ. And persecution is man upon man. It's just, I hate you. I don't like what you say. I am going to judge you. And I am going to hurt you. And I'm going to kill you. But when it comes to the indignation, the wrath of God, this is the judgment, the tribulation that we see from the first seal being broken all the way up until the last trumpet be, or the last bowl being poured out in the book of Revelation, God's judgment. And it starts off with the horseman, man upon man, and slowly moves into cosmic events. And then eventually, when you get into the bowl judgments, you see all hell being released. And God actually allows Satan to come out and judge the world. And that's going to be the great tribulation period where many people are going to be saying, oh, just kill us, just kill us, we can't handle this. How do you avoid the indignation? How do you avoid the judgment? Well, you get saved. You get saved. You know, for the indignation of the Lord, back in chapter 34, is against all nations, and his fury is against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them and has given them over to slaughter. In the day of the Lord, we see this in Revelation chapter 19, where the horse's uh, mane, the horse's bridle, would be as how high, how high the blood flows. Also their slain shall be thrown out. The stench shall rise from their corpse. The mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. The heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. We see this in Revelation chapter 6. We see this in 2 Peter chapter 3 that we've already read. You know, the day will come as a thief in the night and the, and the heavens will be burned up. And this is in what Peter wrote. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in a holy conversation and godliness, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of the Lord God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt away with fervent heat. So all these things are going to happen. And what are people saying today? And even in the Christian circles, oh, it's going to get better. Really? It's not going to get better. You know, what, what's going to make it get better? Well, first of all, getting the church out of here. I do believe that the rapture of the church is the, the fuse that starts the tribulation period because now the voice of reason is removed. The voice of truth is removed. We see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. When that which restrained is moved out, then 
evil will be allowed to rule, which means the Antichrist comes onto the scene. Now, the host of heaven shall be dissolved. You know, this universe is vast. How many billions of light years is the universe? This whole universe is going to vaporize. Right now, it's repelling itself because that's what the atomic structure does. It repels itself. The only thing that holds it together is God. And so it's an easy thing for God to hold it together, but it's just as easy for God just to let go. And when he lets go, this whole thing goes into a nuclear fission and just vaporizes with a great heat. You know, when you take a look at Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the amount of antimatter that was put into there was only the size of a quarter. That's all it took. And the night before, when they were doing the Manhattan Project, all the guys got together, Offenheimer and all those guys were sitting around having their last beer because they're looking at each other going, we're going to let this thing go, and we don't know if it can stop. Because once that thing ignited, would it just do a fission all the way around the globe? They didn't know. And so they hoisted their glasses and said, meet here at 6 a.m. or whatever time, we'll push the button and see what happens. That's not a very good scientific method of process as far as I'm concerned. But we know the destruction of it, and we know what happened. The host shall fall down the leaf, as the leaf falls from the vine, the fruit falling from the fig tree. He says, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and the people of my curse for judgment. The people of Israel, the nation of Edom. They are, you know, excuse me, Edom's Israel's enemies. You know, Edom is uh, Ishmael and is or not Esau. I'm sorry, Edom is Esau, a lot of names. And it's a reference there. And it's interesting because everyone in the Middle East is related to each other. They're all related to Abram. And whether you're in the Middle East, it doesn't matter. We're all sons of Abraham. The people of Israel, the people of the Middle East, you know, you're talking about Saudi Arabia, you know, Iraq, Persia, and all those. They all know, well, not Iraq, they believe, you know, they are the Persians, the Babylonians. But everyone in the Middle East is a descendant directly from there, and they accept that. But what they don't accept is the Messiah. They don't accept it. So in verse 6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of the lambs and the goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has sacrificed in Basra or over in Petra. That's actually the rock city Petra. And a great slaughter in the land of Edom. The wild oxen shall come down with them and the young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust saturated with fatness. And so we're seeing the enemies of Israel and all these things happening. When Israel, when you take, you know, right now the big conversation in the prophetic picture, it's Ezekiel 38 and 39. You know, you hear those, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And I'm wondering, you know, how important is Ezekiel 38 and 39? Quite frankly, it's super important, and I understand that. But take a look at what's already happened. Chapter 36 and 37 have already been fulfilled. The Bible says in chapter 36 that God will heal their land. God has healed their land. Chapter 37 says God will bring Israel back to the land that will be healed and is being healed accordingly. And we saw that in May of 1948. We know that 38 and 39 of Ezekiel will be happening. There's going to be a battle. We're going to see the northern kingdoms calm down. They're going to have a hook in the jaw and they're going to be drawn down as a bear is brought down. We know that. When is chapter 38 and 39 happening in the prophetic picture? We do not know exactly. Is it before the rapture? Is it just after the rapture? Is it, you know, literally, literally seconds, you know, after the rapture? Is the rapture going to be what triggers Ezekiel 38 and 39 to happen? Is the battle between the whole nation of Israel and all those things going? What's going to draw the northern kingdoms into Israel? Because Israel used to be a waste place. Nothing was there. The only thing that was there was ideology. You know, it's the religion, it's the, the ideology. So we own it, no, the Arabs own it, no, you know, the Sunni own it, the Shiite own it, whatever it is, they all own it. But now you know what the big key is? Because just recently, and we know this for a fact, within the past 20 years, hundreds, you know, trillions of cubic feet of natural gas and oil. It's a powerhouse. Massive amounts of oil. 
And it was interesting because it used to be a joke in the old Jewish culture. It's like, you know, when Abraham was, you know, deciding where to go, he, he should have, you know, <laughs> they always say when Abraham, you know, ended up in Israel and all that stuff, he should have made a right-hand turn and actually go in the other, gone the other direction to where all the oil was and ended up closer to the Gulf. But in reality, God has been holding back the natural gas and the oil reserves underneath Israel for all these thousands of years. And now there's a reason why the northern kingdom needs it. Because if you take a look at the global picture, we already know that Russia is now going to be selling oil to Europe. We already know that China and Russia are in league with each other. How many people remember back in the 70s and the 80s? Oh, it's going to be Russia, the bear, and the six million is going to be China. Remember those? But now, guess what? They're, they're buddies. You know, right now, you got China and Cuba training the Cuban military. That's pretty close to us, by the way. And you got Russia now joined with China because of Afghanistan. Now they can join forces. In this whole prophetic picture, everything is falling into place for one purpose and one purpose only. For the Lord to look at his son and say, go for it. Now. And that's what we're looking forward to. Now, here's the problem. We're on this side, aren't we? And we hate what's going on. It's frustrating. It's aggravating. It's like, well, Lord, it, it, uh, and it's heartbreaking because it shouldn't be happening, but it is. So we live in the most exciting times. You know, for such a day as this, we have been called. We have been birthed to live now where we are. Really exciting, interesting, interesting, you know, interesting times that we live. Uh, he goes on and he says, um, I just lost my place. Petra, yeah, oh yeah, finish verse seven. For the day of the Lord's vengeance, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion, its stream shall be turned into pitch, and its dust into brimstone, its land shall become a burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day, its smoke shall ascend forever, and the gener from generation to generation it shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. And again, it's interesting, the natural gas and the oil that is there, everybody wants it. It's going to be there. Billions of barrels of oil, billions of cubic feet or trillions of cubic feet of natural gas all within there. It doesn't mean that Israel is going to blow up. <laughs> you know? But man, it's going to be the cause of war. And it shall, be, it shall not be quenched day or night. The smoke shall ascend forever. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. He says, but the pelican... And the porcupine, you look at these two little critters, you know, the pelican and the por the owl or the hedgehog, because uh, they don't have porcupines over there. You know, porcupines are interesting. You ever have an encounter with a porcupine, anyone? Our dog did. Yeah, and uh, it was quite the event. It took hours and a lot of surgery to get all the quills out of his mouth. Yeah. But these little critters, they run around, they are sticky. You know, the worst thing in the world for a porcupine to be is in a balloon factory. Yeah, you know, that's what the commercial says, I think. And yeah, I know. I saw that on a commercial. Yeah, that's not mine. But it's actually talking about the little hedgehog. And the hedgehogs are like many porcupines. are like these little tiny cute things, and they get them as pets. And also the owl, another word for it. You know, and the owl and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out over it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. Uh, the, the word there for confusion and emptiness is tohu for bohu. And we see this in Genesis chapter one, uh, you know, when in uh, verse, uh, 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 verse 25, I believe, you don't have to turn there, but tohu for bohu is the word that we see uh, where it says, and God made the beasts of the earth according, oh, no, that's not the right one. Let's see, verse five, maybe. I think it's in verse 5, I'm sorry. And God said, the earth was, he said, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the word without form and void is tohu fabohu, which is the Hebrew word for emptiness and, and just this, this, it was empty. And then God put something into it. And they shall call as nobles to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all his princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in its places, nettles and brambles in its fortress. 
and it shall be the habitation of jackals. And the word jackals actually translate howling ones. You know, if you ever heard a pack of coyotes or coyotes, however you want to pronounce. But, you know, it's just kind of an eerie feeling when you're out there at night. It's kind of the dead of night and it's very still. You don't hear anything. Then all of a sudden these guys start to howl off. It, it kind of puts your hair on end. It's a very uncertain feeling, you know, that the howling ones. And a courtyard, again, for the ostriches or the, or the owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the jackals, and the wild goats shall bleat to its companion. And also the night creature shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There the arrow snake shall make her nest and lay her eggs and hatch and gather them under her shadow. And there also shall the hawks be gathered and everyone with her own mate. It's just going to be a place for animals. And the thing about the snakes kind of makes it a little bit, you know, unpleasant to be there. But they're all going to be there. Now look at verse 16. Search from the book of the Lord and read. Search from the book of the Lord and read. You know, it's interesting. Search for the book of the Lord and read. Understand, we see this and we talk about the, the knowledge of the Lord and how we are supposed to gain knowledge. And you can't do that unless you read the Bible. And if you read the Bible, read it with diligence. Read it book by book, chapter by chapter. Pick a book and devour it, and then go to the next book and devour it. Don't be the typical, well, let me find out where the Lord wants me to read. You flop it open, you read the chapter, and you're done. No. And don't just do it for a check mark. I'm just going to read my daily bread, get a couple of verses in, go about my day because I've accomplished something. No, it says, search from the book of the Lord and read. Search means get into it. Search means Find something. Search means be aware that it's going to talk to you. And when you find out what it is, and I guarantee you, that's going to be a blessing to you. And I think I read this the other day because I love, you know, the, I, the whole book of Psalms. But when you take a look at Psalm 100 and, uh, 118, verse 8, it says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in princes. And I look at this verse, search from the book of the Lord and read. Put your trust in the Lord and get your knowledge and understanding and your wisdom from him. And don't be afraid of knowledge. Please, don't be afraid. Oh, if I learn something, I'll make it scared. We have to know things. You know, and people today just want to stick their head. And, and, and just a quick question. How many people know, well, do ostriches actually bury their head in the sand? And the answer is no, they don't. That was a story that was started however many years ago. Well, if you bury your head in the sand, it's all better because ignorance is bliss. And that is a true statement. If you're totally ignorant about the circumstances, life is bliss because you're walking around going, la, 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 and everything's great. You got your hand over your eyes, your hand over your ears, your hand over your mouth, and you're just cruising through life. You don't have to worry about a thing. And God hasn't asked us to do that. God has asked us to be knowledgeable about what search from the book of the Lord and read. He says, not one, of these th shall, well, not one of these shall fail. The Bible is 100% accurate. Did you know that every prophecy that God prophesied was fulfilled 100%? Not 99.8%, but 100%. Perfectly, by name, by day, by time. And it's an amazing thing how people criticize it. You know, not one of these things in the word shall fail. Not one shall lack her mate. In other words, it will be complete. It says, for my mouth has commanded it, and his spirit has gathered them. Man, the Lord is stating this. I have commanded this, and the spirit has gathered them. He has cast the lot for them, and his hand has divided it among them with a measuring line. They shall possess it forever from generation to generation, and they shall dwell in it. You know, Israel will never lose possession of Jerusalem. That's a good thing. Jerusalem and Israel are God's personal real estate. He gave it to Israel to manage. Israel manages it to the best of their ability. Right now, there's a lot of concern about the new government in Israel. Do we trust it? Do we not trust it? Whatever the circumstances may be. But here's the good news. What settles down from heaven on the new heaven and the new earth? It's definitely not the new New York or the new San Francisco. It's not, hey, we're going to get Seattle or Portland. and it's gonna... No, this is the new Jerusalem. It's God's city. It's his place. It's his real estate. 
and it will never, ever, ever fail. And I thank the Lord for that. So search from the book of the Lord and read. That's our encouragement. Next week, we, well, actually, next week we won't be covering this. We're going to have a um, ministry coming in next week. But read ahead, chapter 35. Go ahead and jump ahead to chapter 40. You might as well read up to at least chapter 40. We're getting closer to the end of the book. But do read it. And please, search from the book of the Lord. Search it. Search it. Let's pray. Lord, we do come before you and we thank you. We thank you that we can search for your word. And Lord, your word has been given to us, has been granted to us. We have the ability to read it. We have the ability to search it and to get knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And Lord, you encourage that. So I do pray in Jesus' name that we would be students of the word, that we would search it out, and that we would be faithful in what you have called us to. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight, and I ask in Jesus' name that you would just touch our hearts as we leave. And so, Father, we come before you knowing that as a believer in Jesus Christ, we're here to give the word of God and the gospel of your Son. And I do pray that we would do that. So, Lord, help us. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, God bless and look forward to seeing you guys Saturday morning. The ladies are going to be here for the... uh, the Holocaust uh, discussion that's going to be on, and then uh, we'll see you guys on Sunday. Such practical teaching from the Apostle Paul as he was being inspired by God on how to live the Christian life. So let's take our Bibles this week and see what we can do to apply it in our lives today. Now, if you would like to know more about our church, or you have made the decision to receive Christ as your Savior, you believe that Christ died for you and was buried and rose again to pay for your sins, and you've put your complete faith and trust in Him for that salvation, we'd like to hear from you. You can contact us by the number that is below on the screen. So, till next time, be in the Word, and may God bless you and keep you in His grace.